Hi everyone, it's Professor Primerton. In this video, we're going to look at the fundamental theorem of calculus. We're going to find out that the fundamental theorem of calculus gives us an inverse relationship between the derivative and the definite integral. So the theorem is very appropriate that we finish the last couple sections talking about it because it gives us a connection between the two branches of calculus. Most of the course was about differential calculus, which came about from the tangent line problem, find the slope of a curve or slope of the tangent line at a point. And the last chapter, we've been talking about integral calculus, which gives us somewhat of an unrelated problem, which is called the area problem. How to find the area bounded by a curve above the horizontal axis. So the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus deals with functions that are defined by an equation of this form that involves a definite integral. So the function is g of x is defined to be the definite integral from t equals a to t equals x f of t dt. So a couple things we want to notice is that x is a variable of g for the function g. And it varies between a and b. So this is t equals a and t equals b. On the other hand, t is a dummy variable. It will not matter what the variable that we use in the integrand of the function f. The only restrictions that we have to be concerned about is that f of t must be a continuous function on the closed interval a to b. So in other words, the function is integrable. And x varies between a and b. So notice that g of x, it only depends on the upper limit of integration. So x is the input variable, and it's in the upper limit of integration. So if x is a real number, then the definite integral is from t equals a to t equals x, f of t dt. This becomes a definite number. We're going to let x vary so that the number for the integral will also vary and will give us a function of x. And that's what we're calling g of x. So notice that this x is going to be varying between t equals a and a value t equals b. And so if x is changing, then so will this value of the definite integral, and that's going to give us a function. So this is how you can interpret it visually, what the function g of x is representing. The function g of x is the accumulated area from a to x for the function f of t. So as the x is increasing, it starts at x equals a. If this x is a definitive number, then you're trying to find out the area from t equals a to t equals x, and that would be this, this region, this area. Well, the value of x can be anything between t equals a and t equals b. So you can think of the function g of x as it's the area thus far or so far from t equals a up to this value of x. So keep in mind, if your function is positive, then g of x can be interpreted as the area under the graph of f of t from t equals a to t equals x. And keep in mind that your x can be any value between t equals a and t equals b. So think of the function g of x as the area so far, starting at t equals a, and you're going up to the upper limit, which is a variable, t equals x. So to give us an idea of how this fundamental theorem of calculus works, and where the function is defined to be a definite integral, we're going to do example one. Let f of t be a function whose graph is given below, and the function is continuous, f of t. And you're defining g of x to be the same as it was stated in the fundamental theorem of calculus. It's the definite integral 
from a to x, f of t dt. And we're going to find out these values of g. So notice from the graph, in this problem, the values of a is 0 and is the lower limit of integration. So in other words, the area for this function f of t is starting at, at t equals 0. So that is the value of a. So now let's get right into it. Let's find out these values. So note that g of 0 would be if your x value is 0. So it's the definite integral from a equals 0 to x equals 0, f of t dt. So this would be 0 because of the 0 width interval. So that was a property that we talked about when we when we discussed definite integrals. So g of 0 is 0. So now let's look at the graph. So from the graph, notice that g of 1, which is defined to be the definite integral from a equals 0, which is up to 1, f of t dt, is the area of a triangle. So this area would be from 0 to 1. It would be the area so far between t equals 0 and t equals 1. So let's find out the value of g of 1. g of 1 is the integral from 0 to 1, f of t dt, which is the area of a triangle, 1 half times base times height. Notice that the base of the triangle is 1 and the height of the triangle is 2. So g of 1 will turn out to be just 1. All right, let's try the next value. Again, from the graph, we can find the value of g of 2, which is defined to be the definite integral from 0 to 2, f of t dt. So looking at the graph this time, we're going from t equals 0 to t equals 2. We're going to accumulate the area up to including the area of the triangle, but also of this rectangle. And we're going up to t equals 2. So it's the area of a triangle and rectangle. All right, so the function's value at x equals 2 would be well, we can use definite integral properties to rewrite this. So it's the integral from 0 to 1, f of t dt, plus the integral from 1 to 2, f of t dt, using the additivity rule for definite integrals. We already found out the area from 0 to 1. That was the triangle. The area was 1. And then the area of the rectangle that's formed between t equals 1 and t equals 2 would be length times width. And notice from the graph that the length is 2 and the width is 1. So now the area so far is 3 from t equals 0 to t equals 2. So, so far we've been able to use geometric shapes and their areas to find out the value of the definite integral. So from t equals 2 to t equals 3, notice from the graph we're going to have to estimate. So we can estimate the value of g of 3 which, of course, is the definite integral from 0 to 3, f of t dt, since the area from t equals 2 to t equals 3 does not form a nice geometric shape. So notice from the graph that we're going to accumulate the area from t equals 0 to t equals 3 now. So this would give us this region, 
that we have to accumulate the area for, and its upper boundary is a curve, not a straight line, like the last two areas. So we're going to find out the value that g of 3 is the integral from 0 to 3, f of t dt, which, again, use the additivity property. It's the area from 0 to 2, f of t dt, plus the integral from 2 to 3, f of t dt. Well, we already found out the area from 0 to 2. That was 3. And approximation of the area from t equals 2 to t equals 3 is about 1.3. So the area so far is about 4.3. So that's the value of g of 3. So now, two more values. Notice that when t is greater than 3, the values of the function of f of t are negative because the function is below the horizontal axis. And we begin to start subtracting the areas. So let's go up to the graph. Between t equals 3 and t equals 4, the function is below the axis, the t-axis. So this area is going to be negative in terms of the definite integral value. But it looks identical to the area that we found from t equals 2 to t equals 3. So in essence, we're just going to subtract off 1.3 again. So the value g of 4 is the definite integral from 0 to 4, f of t dt. It's the definite integral from 0 to 3, f of t dt, plus the area from 3 to 4, f of t dt. And like I said, that's 4.3 that we found so far from 0 to 3, but from 3 to 4, it just looks like the equivalent of 1.3 again, but we have to subtract. So now we're back to the value is 3. And likewise, you can find out g of 5. g of 5 is the definite integral from 0 to 5, f of t dt and it's the area between 0 and 4 f of t dt plus the last area that we have to find between 4 to 5 f of t dt. Let's go up to the graph and see what the area might be approximately equal to. So notice that this graph from t equals 3 to t equals 5 it looks symmetric about the line t equals 4. So this area between 4 and 5 looks also identical to 1.3. So this would be 3, subtract another 1.3. So now the value is 1.7 for the accumulated area between t equals 0 and t equals 5. So let's take a look at the graphs. This gives us a visual representation of what we just found. The top left corner, this graph is representing the value g of 1, was the area between 0 to 1, f of t dt. And we found out the value was 1 of this area of the triangle. g of 2 was the definite integral from 0 to 2, f of t dt. And that was the sum of the areas of a triangle and rectangle. And we found out the area was 3. g of 3 was the integral from 0 to 3, f of t dt. And this was approximately 4.3 because the upper boundary from t equals, 3, t equals 2 to t equals 3 was a curve. And in the bottom left corner, this is the value g of 4, definite integral from 0 to 4, f of t dt. And this was found to be about 3, because we were subtracting the area from t equals 3 to t equals 4. And the last value that we found was g of 5, which was the integral from 0 to 5, f of t dt, and that was about 1.7, because we also had to subtract another 1.3 from t equals 4 to t equals 5. So we can use these calculated values for the function g to sketch a graph. So notice that the function f of t is positive when the t is less than 3. So up to t equals 3 where we're adding the area. And th that means the function g of x, which is, which is accumulating the area, will be increasing up to x equals 3. Now keep in mind it's x because g of x depends on x, not t. So that means that x equals 3, you will have a local maximum. 
Now that's talking about the maximum area that's accumulated thus far would occur when x equals 3. But when x is greater than 3, we were subtracting the areas, so that means g of x will be decreasing, and that was because f of t was negative. So this gives you a sketch of the graph of g of x. So this is just a sketch of the graph g of x when you're accumulating the area under the function f of t. So this is the first step in the fundamental theorem of calculus. Understanding this function g of x is, acc is accumulating the area under a function f of t. So now we're going to start building up to the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. So example two, if the function g of x is defined to be a definite integral from t equals a to t equals x, f of t dt, where we're going to assume that a is 1 in this problem, and the function f of t is the integrand t squared. Find a formula for g of x, and then we're going to find the derivative of g of x. Okay, so let's substitute in the values. g of x is the integral from a, which is 1 in this problem, and x is the upper limit of integration. f of t is t squared, and the variable of integration is t. So the integer of t squared is 1 third t cubed. Evaluate from t equals 1 to t equals x using the evaluation theorem. So the upper limit of integration is substituted in first. So 1 third x to the third. Subtract 1 third times 1 cubed. So 1 third x cubed. Subtract 1 third. So that is the function g of x. It's a cubic function. 1 third x cubed minus a third. Now let's find out the derivative. g prime would be the derivative with respect to x of 1 third x cubed subtract 1 third. Well, we already know how to do these. This is a nice polynomial function. The derivative of 1 third x cubed gives you just x squared. And the derivative of 1 third just disappears anyways. It's just a constant. So the function g prime of x is just x squared. So the fact that we've just found out is that g prime of x was x squared, but the integrand f of t was t squared in the previous example. This actually gives us the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. So it states if f of x is a continuous function, on a closed interval a to b, so it's integrable, you have a function g of x is defined to be a definite integral from t equals a to t equals x, f of t dt, and remember that the x can be any value between a and b. g of x is an antiderivative of f of x. In other words, if you take the derivative of g, you get f of x, just like we found out in the previous example. So if you take the derivative of g, you get x squared, but that is the function evaluated x. It's also x squared on this interval. Well, Leibniz notation in terms of derivatives states that the derivative of this definite integral from t equals a to t equals x, f of t dt, is really just the integrand evaluated at the upper limit of integration, which is just x, where the function is continuous. So in other words, this says if you first integrate f of t, which is the inside, and then you differentiate that answer, just like we did in example two, you just get the original function evaluated at the upper limit of integration. So let's try example three. Use the fundamental theorem of calculus to differentiate each of the following integrals. Okay, number one, we're going to have this function g of x defined to be a integral from 1 to x where the integrand is 5 divided by t squared plus 7 and the variable of integration is t. Well, find the derivative. So g prime would be 5 divided by x squared plus 7. So it's the integrand evaluate at the upper limit of integration. The, it doesn't matter what the lower limit of integration is because when you take the derivative, it will just be a derivative of a constant and, and it just disappears. So since f of t is 5 divided by t squared plus 7 is continuous, 
on the closed interval 1 to x. Number 2. Let's have the function g of x to be defined this way. It's the integral from 2 to x, e, 4t squared, subtract 2t, and the exponent, and then dt. So again, g prime, it does not matter what the lower limit of integration is, because the derivative will just be 0, after you do the antiderivative of the e to the 4t squared minus 2t. What matters is the upper limit of integration is just x. So this will be e to the 4x squared to track 2x. And we can say this because f of t is continuous. It's an exponential function. From 2 to x. So number 3. This time the function is g of y, so that means the upper limit of integration is going to be in terms of y this time. Negative 4 to y, t squared times sine of 5t dt. So this time will be g prime of y. So the upper limit of integration is y, and the lower limit of integration is just a constant. So this will be y squared times sine of 5y since again the integrand is t squared times sine of 5t is continuous on the interval negative 4 to y okay a couple more number four this will give us an idea of how the fun fundamental theorem of calculus works Capital G of X is defined to be this definite integral from X to 3. Cosine of the square root of T dt. Well, from the fundamental theorem of calculus, the upper limit of integration is a variable, and the lower limit of integration is a constant. So notice that the variable X, which is depending on what the function G of X is, is in the lower limit of integration. Well, we can use the reversal of integration limits, interchange the limits of integration to be 3 to x, but you have to introduce a negative. The integrand stays the same, dt. So now you can differentiate. Capital G prime of x is cosine of square root of x, but keep, in tra keep track of that negative. Negative cosine of the square root of x since f of t cosine of the square root of t is a continuous function. From 3 to x. Alright, one more of these problems. Number 5. This time the function is g of w, which is the definite integral from w to negative 2. And this time the function is 9 plus t squared inside a square root dt. So the same idea as the last problem. The variable, which is where g of w depends, is in the lower limit of integration. So reverse the order again. So negative 2 to w but introduce a negative, square root 9 plus t squared dt. Now take the derivative, so g prime of w would be the opposite of square root 9 plus w squared, since f of t is continuous on the closed interval negative 2 to w. So this gives you an idea of how the fundamental theorem of calculus, the first part of it, actually works. So with the last example, we were using the fundamental theorem of calculus to find the derivative of a function that was defined in terms of a integral. Well now we're going to use the fundamental theorem of calculus and the chain rule to differentiate the following integrals. So the reason why we have to use the chain rule is what's going to happen in problem number one. So the function is g of x. It's defined to be the definite integral from 1 
to x to the fourth power secant of t dt. Well, notice that the upper limit of integration is no longer just x, it's a function. But the lower limit of integration is also still a constant. So the idea is that, notice that we can let u be the upper limit of integration, take the derivative of u, so derivative of u with respect to x, this is where the chain rule comes in, you have 4x cubed. So then the integral becomes integral from 1 to u secant of t dt. Now take the derivative of g. So the derivative of g of x would be the derivative of this definite integral from 1 to u secant of t dt, which is the derivative with respect to u of the integral from 1 to u secant of t dt. So you take the derivative of the integral from 1 to u, where u is the variable. So you take the derivative of the outside function. Then you take the derivative of the inside function, which is this u. So it's du dx is the derivative of the inside. And that's where the chain rule comes in. So g prime of x would be, well, the derivative of the integral with respect to u, where u is the variable and it's the upper limit of integration, is just like the last problems we were doing. It's secant of u times du dx. And now replace the u. Secant of u would become secant of x to the fourth, and du dx was 4x cubed. So 4x cubed, secant x to the fourth. And that's the derivative of g of x. So you have a derivative of the outside function, which is the definite integral, and then derivative of the inside function. The inside function is the upper limit of integration in this case. So number two, g of x is defined to be this definite integral. It's from e to the x to zero. Five sine cubed of t dt. So again, notice that the lower limit of integration is not a constant. It's not even a variable. It's a function. So there's a couple things we need to do. Let u equal e to the x, then take the derivative. du dx is also e to the x. But also notice that you have to reverse the order of integration. So let's do both of this at the same time. This would be the integral, the opposite of the integral from 0 to u, 5 sine cubed of t dt. So reverse the order of integration, introduce the negative, and also replace e to the x with a u. Now take the derivative, because it's in the form that we can use the fundamental theorem of calculus. It's the derivative with respect to x, because the variable g was in terms of x, of the integral 0 to u, don't forget about the negative, 5 sine cubed of t dt, which is the derivative of the outside function, 0 to u, sine cubed of t times 5 dt, times the derivative of the inside, which is du dx. So the derivative would be opposite of 5 sine cubed of the upper limit of integration, which in this case is u, times the derivative of the inside function. So negative 5 sine to the third power of u was e to the x. And then the derivative of the inside function is also e to the x. So negative 5 e to the x sine cubed of e to the x. That's the derivative of this function g of x. Okay, a couple more. Number three. This time the function is called h of x. It's the definite integral from 4 to 1 divided by x, inverse tangent of t dt. So notice that the upper limit of integration is this time a function again. So let that be u. 
So u is 1 divided by x. Then the derivative of u is negative 1 divided by x squared. So our integral becomes integral from 4 to u inverse tangent of t dt. So we can use the fundamental theorem of calculus to find the derivative. It's the derivative with respect to x of the integral from 4 to u inverse tangent of t dt and that is the derivative with respect to u of the integral 4 to u inverse tangent of t dt times the derivative of the inside which is du dx. So h prime of x would be Again, it does not matter what the lower limit of integration is, as long as it's a constant. So it will be inverse tangent, evaluated at the upper limit of integration, which is u, times du dx, which is inverse tangent, replace the u with 1 divided by x, and then du dx was negative 1 divided by x squared, so this becomes opposite of inverse tangent, of 1 divided by x and then divide by x squared. So that would be the derivative of h of x. Alright, last one of these problems, number 4. We have h of x is defined to be the definite integral from 3x to 5x u squared subtract 1 divided by u squared plus 1 du. So notice that you cannot use u this time because u is being used as the dummy variable for the integrand and the variable of integration. So there are several ideas that go into this problem. First, notice that the upper limit of integration and the lower limit of integration are both functions. So we need to have some way of introducing a limit of integration at the constant. So here's how you do that. Let's use the additivity rule for definite integrals. Let's go from 3x up to a number b, u squared minus 1 divided by u squared plus 1 du, plus the integral will be from b up to the upper limit of integration 5x of the same integrand u squared minus 1 over u squared plus 1 du. Now what is this number b? b is a real number such that 3x is less than or equal to b, which is less than or equal to 5x. It doesn't matter what the real number constant is. It will just disappear anyways with the theorem. So as long as the b is somewhere between 3x and 5x, we can break the integral up this way. So now let's approach this problem as we did in the last three, three parts. So we have integral from 3x to b. Let's call w will be 3x. And the derivative of w with respect to x is just 3. But at the same time, we have this other integral that's from b to 5x. So the upper limit of integration is a function, so let's use v. v equals 5x, and the derivative of v with respect to x is 5. So now we're ready to actually calculate the derivative. h prime of x is the derivative with respect to x of both of these integrals. Now, the first integral we need to rearrange the limits of integration, so opposite of the integral from b to 3x, u squared minus 1 divided by u squared plus 1 du, plus integral from b to 5x. The second integral is fine because the upper limit of integration is just 5x, u squared minus 1 divided by u squared plus 1 du. Well, replace the 3x and the 5x with w and v, respectively. So it's the derivative with respect to x of the integral, don't forget about the negative sign again, b to w, u squared minus 1 divided by u squared plus 1 du plus 
integral from b to v of the same integrand. So this gives us the derivative of the outside function, which is w, so d dw of negative integral from b to w, u squared minus 1 over u squared plus 1 du, and then times by dw dx. So it's the derivative of the outside function and the derivative of the inside function, plus the derivative with respect to v of integral from b to v, u squared minus 1 divided by u squared plus 1 du, and then the derivative of the inside would be dv dx. So it's just the same problems as 1, 2, and 3. It's just we're doing it twice because we have two separate integrals. So now we're in a position to actually find out what's the derivative of the outside and the inside functions. So the derivative of this first integral will be opposite of the integrand evaluated at w. So w squared minus 1 divided by w squared plus 1 times dw dx that was 3 plus the derivative of the second integral would be the integrand evaluated at v v squared minus 1 divided by v squared plus 1 times dv dx was 5 so now we have to go back and replace what we substituted in from the first part we replace all the w's with 3x and all the v's with 5x so this gives us negative 3. w squared is 3x squared minus 1 divided by 3x all squared plus 1. And the other term would be plus 5 times v squared minus 1. v is 5x. So 5x squared minus 1 divided by 5x all squared plus 1. And then, of course, this simplifies as negative 3 times 9x squared subtract 1 divided by 9x squared plus 1 plus 5 times 25x squared minus 1 divided by 25x squared plus 1. And that's the derivative of this function h of x. And the last part of this video is about the idea behind differentiation and integration are inverse processes or inverse operations. We're going to take the two parts of the fundamental theorem of calculus, which is the evaluation theorem and the fundamental theorem of calculus part one, that gives you a relationship between integration and differentiation as follows. So the evaluation theorem we talked about in the last section, it relates integrals and derivatives. That means you find the antiderivative and you evaluate at the upper limit of integration and the lower limit of integration and you subtract the two. This is called the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. So the fundamental theorem of calculus can be stated in these two statements. You have f of x is continuous on a closed interval a to b. The first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus is this function g of x is defined to be a definite integral from t equals a to t equals x, f of t dt, and the derivative of g of x gives you the integrand evaluated at the upper limit of integration as long as it's a variable, and the lower limit of integration is a constant. So g prime of x is f of x. The second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus is the evaluation theorem. If f of x is an antiderivative, of f of x, so that means you take the derivative of the antiderivative, you get f of x, then you can evaluate a definite integral, then you can evaluate a definite integral from x equals a to x equals b by finding the antiderivative of the integrand, so capital F, evaluate at the upper limit of integration, and subtract, evaluate the antiderivative at the lower limit of integration. And we also noticed from the previous version that you can write the derivative of the definite integral where we define g of x to be the definite integral. It's the integrand evaluated at the upper limit of integration. So it's 
f of t is integrated first, then you differentiate, you will always arrive with the original function back, but you evaluate at the upper limit of integration. And in the previous section, we reformulated the second version in terms of the net change theorem. It states that if you take the function f, capital F prime of x, dx, and the integral from x equals a to x equals b, it's the same as taking the antiderivative, capital F, evaluate at b, subtract the antiderivative evaluated at a. So if you take the derivative first, so capital F prime of x, and then you integrate second, you again arrive at the original function. But it takes in the form f of b minus f of a because you have limits of integration. So if you think about these last two statements, differentiation and integration are inverse processes of each other. So the first statement was if you take the antiderivative of f of t and then you differentiate after that, then you get the original integrand, but you evaluate at the upper limit of integration. So it's a function. Whereas the evaluation theorem says, if the integrand is a derivative, so you take the derivative already, then you integrate, you get the original function back, which is capital F, but you're going to get a real number because A and B are real numbers for the limits of integration. So the fundamental theorem of calculus is just another way of saying that differentiation and integration are inverse processes of each other. So this finishes our discussion on the fundamental theorem of calculus. If you have any questions about anything in this video or any of the examples, please let me know. Or if you have any questions while you work on the homework in terms of the fundamental theorem of calculus, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you at the next video when we talk about the substitution rule.